Uh, you're welcome to yet another edition of the League of the Genuine Conversations uh, with me, Fred Muema. We have a break uh, every month. We have a guest of the month. Uh, and this month, uh, we have a special guest, uh, a public figure, vice chairperson, private sector foundation, chairperson of Uganda Agribusiness Alliance, uh, former director of the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, for more than 17 years, uh, former Minister of Agriculture, actually I think the first Minister of Agriculture uh, for, the, for this government uh, for, for many, many years, uh, a senior citizen. Uh, join me in welcoming Honorable Victoria Sakitoleko. Uh, nice to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yes, and I'm very happy that uh, you are able to honor the invitation at a very short notice uh, because you're one of those people uh, that encouraged us to put up the anti-counterfeit network. Um, as a mother, as a woman, I am sure you have had challenges around counterfeits. Uh, but we would like uh, to know from your public service life, um, Right now, the Ministry of Agriculture has put up a committee to investigate the cause of this big problem in agricultural inputs. And did you have back then, from 1986, uh, when you were the Minister of Agriculture, did you have a counterfeit problem in agro inputs? I guess that the problem was there, but Uganda did not have a big challenge. Basically because at that time, the ministry approved everything that came in. And it was difficult, if not impossible, <clears throat> to bring in anything we have not approved. I remember one time I was watching TV and I saw a knapsack sprayer being uh, advertised. And this person was actually carrying it on his back and, uh, and spraying. There was no protective clothing. He was not even wearing shoes was just barefooted. That evening, I picked up the phone, called the commissioner in charge of, uh, of, 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 of crops, and the following day, the, the advert did not appear. These days, I doubt any minister has that power. <laughs> to, to, to do that? To just stop it, because if you, at that time, we used to have only one television, UBC, so it was of UBC. But now I'm definitely sure if you complain to one of them, it, it, the, the, the advertiser would just move to the other. So at that time, everything, like tractors, were all approved by government. And we knew where they were coming from. We knew who the importers were. I remember one time I was uh, seated in my house and I was told I had a visitor. This visitor had come to talk to me about importing tractors from a certain East, uh, East, East European country. And I told them that uh, we have discussed those tractors they are they are a hundred horsepower in uganda the highest we should ever go is 75 because of the fear of over privatization which means making the soil so loose that you just lose it so uh, i told this lady that because uh, she was my friend and a friend of the uh, supplier as, as, aspiring supplier i told her he has talked to me to me directly and i have said no and whatever happens i'm not going to say yes so uh, he, she left told, and uh, when she went and told her, him, he said if she has said no to you, I don't think she's going to say yes to anybody. So I give up. But then the giving up was temporary. After that he went to Minister of Internal Affairs and somehow they connived and imported the tractors and uh, prisons. But that those tractors rotted at Namaliri because nobody could use them. They were too strong. For... They were too strong. So, but anyway, during those days, that is how we dealt with this. So they, there was no shortcut. That is one. Two, everybody spoke the same language, especially the engineers. They were too respected to go fake. But these days when I look at a situation where, you know, you ask, uh, I was, I was, you were talking, um, talking about agricultural inputs. And I asked, but there must be somebody who knows what is going on. Then somebody tells me, but they are all in it together. Who? Who are those? The, 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 the chemists who know what the content of uh, whatever fake it is in agriculture, the, the power 
of the machines which are being imported, the, 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 the coating. Because, for example, now, if you go to any of those shows where, I'm going to name the countries because this is real, Egypt, Turkey, and uh, there's another country, they normally do their, their show at Lugogo. When you go there, you find they bring some food processors which look simple and look affordable, but then whatever material they make them from, they put a silver coating. Now, the moment you start processing groundnuts, cassava, or whatever in that processor, the paint peels the off. The paint peels off and the people eat it. So the question I've always asked is, really, doesn't anybody see what I see? They, it, they, 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 that those shows have not been there for one or two years, for a long time. And they always bring the same thing, and they always sell. So, so what happens to the inspection department? Exactly. What happens to standards? That is when I was told that they are in it together. But Honorable, won't somebody say that maybe that also happened during your time? You've just given the example of the tractors which rotted at Namalere. Did you, as uh, the minister responsible for agriculture, cause the prosecution of whoever did that import? I wish I had, but unfortunately, I had left. Oh, they rotted <laughs> after. I had, they arrived after. They arrived because after. Because if they had been there, first of all, my if headquarters would have known what is going to Namalere. And there is no way I would have allowed them to store them there because this was more or less stolen property. If you, if you are bought for internal affairs, internal affairs is there. Take them to them. But now, Honorable, you, the way you are speaking, you give hope and you look like uh, you're the kind of uh, person who can serve the public. Why do you do politics? I'm a grandmother and the job of the grandmother is to give hope. <laughs> but to serve as well. Why, why did I leave politics? Yes. I'm a grandmother. My sons were ready to take over the job. To take over the job but see where you have left us now we have fake seedlings they don't germinate we have you told me a story of fake bulls president what what was that story about <laughs> it was interesting our president visited the republic of congo and he found that there is a, a certain type of cow called the sarawel sarawel it's, cow uh -huh. it's huge it's brown and it's beautiful it is elegant you re, when you see it you really see a thousand kilograms of beef walking so when the president saw it, he expressed interest in this uh, bull. So they sold him one. And I guess it was flown in because by the time I saw it, it had... It didn't work. It wasn't tired that day, definitely. No, 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 no. It was, uh, no. They took a bit of time. Then the bull arrived and uh, the president let, uh, let, let the, 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 the herdsmen lead the bull to do its work. Now they waited. One month, two months, three years, uh, sorry, two years, nothing happening. So he complained that uh, this bull is not performing. And I told him, I would send you experts. I remember Professor Kayanja, the vet guy, went there, looked at the bull, examined whatever, and told him, this bull has got brucellosis. <laughs> brucellosis. 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 When a bull has that disease, it, can, it, it will mount all right, but the cows will not become pregnant. It is like when uh, somebody, is, a, a man is suffering from, there are some STIs which actually affect the sperm. So its sperm were dead. So while it was a bull in appearance and it could mount and, and everybody elegant, is, and elegant and all air. that. So, so if we can have fakes in the bulls, in the agro inputs and so on, but, but you're saying that before you used to procure directly from the ministry, I'm sure yes. you are aware that uh, <coughs> the government but created... But uh, wait a moment. We did, not pro we did not procure everything as the ministry, yeah. but we dealt with those people, the private sector, which was procuring. And certified and approved exactly. them. Exactly. Because, for example, for the longest time, we, had had, we have had the Massey Ferguson tractor. We knew exactly who was bringing it, where it which country it was coming from. So... Everything was like traceable. So chances of getting anything fake were nil. And this, I can say, is true. Because I remember about 1987, Gaza High School was given a tractor from Master Ferguson. That tractor worked until 20, 2019. That is when they sold it. Like over 30 years, that tractor was still working. Now, if you go for a fake, the story would have been different. Yeah, but I, I think to maybe to the credit of government, they mm. put up 
certain statutory bodies, exactly. corporations, exactly. to regulate the control and, and licensing of some of these inputs. For example, in 2006, I think, mm -hmm. they created the Agriculture Chemical Control Board, yeah. something like that, yeah. to approve. And, but, but why is it that despite the existence of, of the board, you, you still have um, inputs, uh, chemicals coming in, even being locally produced and being licensed? Because the board is technical, it is not doing the logistics, it is not doing the customs, it is not doing all that are, are completely beyond this board. Because uh, right, like right now we have got, uh, what do they call it? When goods are inspected abroad before they are brought in, the containers are loaded with anything but what was inspected. Basically because the inspection stops there, the, the current board does not have the capacity to inspect everything, especially given how porous Ugandan borders are. Because, for example, one of the worst things that is happening now is in cosmetics. Even if the Uganda government board and, uh, and uh, U U UNBS were to control the cosmetics, most of the cosmetics come in people's bags and others come from neighboring countries, really walking on foot, you know, people's bags on foot. How do you control all that? But how was it controlled before? Because this problem has worsened now. Yeah. The borders of Uganda have not changed. No. The border points, customs points, maybe have even increased. Mm -hmm. Even agricultural production has increased. We are mm -hmm. producing more food, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is fake. What has hit us? Is it a moral issue? Partly it is moral, but partly it is the opening up of the artificial borders. Because previously, uh, let's say before the digital era, mm. most people didn't know certain things existed. So once you know, the next thing you find out is how can you access it. The moment you sort out how you can access it, somebody already has cited business. So as far as this person is concerned, he has got a consumer and she will do whatever it takes to make sure that you get that product. If, uh, for example, you find out that um, this product actually works and this is a genuine product, then I come to you and say, you want this product, it costs so much, but I have this one. It's not really the real thing, but it also do you know there's that advert which says <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it will also work. Quite a number of people opt for the cheaper one. Basically because I saw Fred using it and I th he, has, he was showing off, now I'm also in the same league, not knowing that I'm poisoning myself. And when it comes to us farmers, the situation is even worse. Because let's say if you, if you are buying uh, a drug to kill the ticks and I tell you that uh, this is really not the gamaxone you are used to, but it also works. Okay, you take this uh, drug and maybe for the first day because the, the ticks are shocked with this new drug, they fall off, but they just fell off. They did not die. And since the cattle are still in the same place, they'll come back and come back even in bigger numbers. While the seller has completely disappeared, or if he's, uh, if, if he's an established shop, because most of these fakes are actually in established shops, if you go back and tell him that so and so, you sold me this stuff. First day it worked. But then a week later, I saw even more ticks. Ah, ah, you didn't apply properly. Add more. Uh, add, add, add more. And besides, this is November. It is raining too much. You should not even do, uh, the deep just twice a week. You had better either spray or deep every day. So you try, not knowing that you are poisoning yourself. Because in quite a number of cases, they will not tell you that while well, you have been using the other drug, which does not fume a lot. This one causes a lot of fumes. So if you are like 10, 10 meters from that, that uh, wherever you are spraying, this and this is going to happen. So you go, spray more often, use a stronger dose and you are even closer to make sure that uh, every part of the cow is spread. So here you are destroying your farm, yourself and your farm. What is the effect of, of mis misusing or misapplying those acaricides on, on the ticks? What is the effect on the human health? What is the effect on the meat? What's the effect on the milk? For me, my biggest worry are the children, the babies. 
because we tell pregnant women to drink a lot of milk because they need the calcium in order to build the bones. And then when you are feeding the baby, we encourage you to drink milk. And when you are weaning the baby off the breast, we tell you, so you can just imagine this child, while she was still in the womb, we were feeding her on this poison. We give birth to her, we give her breasts, which have been uh, breast milk, which has been adulterated with this uh, chemical. And then six months later, we give her the full dose of this chemical. Are you saying when the mother takes the milk <coughs> with the, the residues uh, of uh, antibiotics or whatever, pesticides or contamination, doesn't the digestion clean it out? And, Not and the, completely. So Not some of it stays. Exactly. But uh, it is worse, as I said, after six months when you start giving the child the milk itself. You know, there's that advert which says uh, breast milk for baby, cow milk for, for, for calf. We, I wish people knew what we are doing to our children. You know, under no circumstances, <laughs> men from certain parts of Uganda are supposed to be tall and elegant. People like you. Because there's no reason why a Msoga man should be a short man. It comes from what they ate. The environment. The, the food. environment. You know, when you see the Sudanese, South Sudan, they may be whatever we want to think of them, but you see how tall they are. And they are tall in every part. I want every Ugandan to hear that. The Sudanese, you may be looking at them, what I don't care how, but because most of what they eat is still natural, you can see how tall they are. That, that was the same with our men from the north. Now, when you find somebody from Lang or somebody from Guru who is less than five feet, you are like, are you fake? <laughs> but Be it is all... Because it's eaten contaminated stuff. Exactly, and exactly. And what is interesting is that quite a number of these short people are coming from middle-income homes. But are you trying to say that when, when you are short, you are defective? Some people genetically are like that. No. Uh, it, it depends what you call ge genetically. Because how come when a number of Ugandans relocate to the U.S., all of a sudden there is no short Ugandan? <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> Unless that. Unless you relocate at They are short age. Americans also. What happens to them? You've not seen them? But uh, even those short Americans, do you know when, when they, they moved to America? They were born in America. Yeah, but let me tell you something. While there are people whose genetics are made to be short. How come when Fred Moema's child, aged 10, moves to the US, all of a sudden he becomes a All my children are taller than me now. There you are. Basically because of how you fed them. For me, my worry there is that uh, this stunting, because currently Uganda has 25% stunting of babies. What stunted, is Stunted, 25%. Oh uh, yeah, of all children born in Uganda now are stunted. The stunting we see on the outside is the physical, short man, short woman. But the, the, the most worrying stunting is in the head. Because the, for a stunted child, when we say 25%, it's a brain which is stunted and then the physical which is stunted. So what you are saying, that these effects we have allowed exactly. to come on the market, to mm -hmm. come into our homes, mm -hmm. are causing far-reaching and permanent exactly. damage. Because once a child is damaged in the, in the womb, really, there's very little we can do. And to make matters worse, like I said, it is not only the, the ignorant. Recently, I, I hosted a family from a rural place, and they came with a, a, a 12-month-old baby who was still breastfeeding. Now, at breakfast, we served the roast maize. There was bread. There were other things. And this one-year-old had never tasted bread, preferred maize, and breastfeeding and he looked perfect but uh, if I had had uh, people like you your child of course would have gone for could bread, have gone for bread uh -huh. yes. but yeah. now all these things you are you are lamenting I'm mm -hmm. going to say you are lamenting mm -hmm. but how can a whole chair of the Uganda agribusiness alliance lament you've been chair for many years so meaning that you have been pretending over this chaos do you do you feel responsible for where we are you should have guided us and avoided this chaos we have. All of us Ugandans are responsible because, you know, sometimes I sit and listen and watch and observe the way Ugandans behave, especially those who traveled abroad and came back. 
those are the ones who will tell you when you go to, 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 to a buffet, they will skip everything Ugandan and look for all those... The important <laughs> fact. Which is really sad. You know, the other day, some, some imported foods were taken off the shelves of a number of supermarkets. Mm. The, but one of them was uh, granite paste. And the question I was asking, given the delicacy, it is a very delicate food, granite paste, why would the Ugandan want it imported from elsewhere? So it was taken off the, the shelf because it was no longer pure. Why? Because apparently these people uh, prepare the, 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 the granite paste and they add kabaka and jagar. I think we call it candle nut. Mm. When you take that, um, you take that uh, seed and pound it and mix it with groundnuts, you can't tell that it is there. But of course, the, the stomach will tell. And the kabaka and jagar is not, it's not nutritious, it's not food? No. The, and certain things, the body is not equipped to chew them. So when it was discovered and they, they, they said they were pulling it off the shelf, but quite a number of Ugandans didn't even know it was being pulled off the shelf. And it cannot be in those supermarkets unless we are buying it. And I see, I keep asking the question, why do you want pe uh, granite paste which has been made elsewhere when you can make it? You know, this is really interesting. Some of the best paste comes from uh, both uh, Guru and Lila. And those women, in quite a number of cases, still grind this paste on the, 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 the grinding stone. They unfortunately cannot like mass produce, but that is fortunate for the consumer. So when I was in Guru, for example, we pack a line up as soon as that woman has finished pounding. Purchase. Yeah, yes, you purchase, well, straight from the factory. And that will at least you are sure what you are taking. But uh, those people from the north suffer from a lot of liver cancer because of that pest they take. Yeah, but it has a aflatoxins, exactly, a lot of it. Which comes from the, from the, the way the groundnut was grown, harvested and dried. Fortunately, now our research, Naro, has come up with a solution which actually starts from the garden. And now that we, like if I'm going to go to that factory, I talk to those women, those women are actually aware and they, have, they are the ones who have actually started talking about it. So, in my view, these fakes, especially fakes in agric agriculture, agribusiness, are real and are a threat to our health and even our nation. Ugandans are proud that we eat organic, we eat what we produce, but not if you are spraying with those things you don't understand. Not if you are using those machines to process, which actually peel off and go into your source. We need to take a break here. Uh, that, those are the words of wisdom. You like to call yourself, uh, not to call yourself. You say you're a grandmother, oh, grandmother. so you're, you're giving advice. When we come back, uh, we shall have more discussion with the Honorable Victoria Sektoriko to find out whether we are living, living or living dead, because apparently the picture that she paints uh, is a bleak one. Uh, everything uh, is probably in a mess. Who is not doing their job? Uh, when we come back, we shall continue the discussion. Welcome back to our second segment of uh, this interview, a guest of the month. Uh, we are hosting Honorable Victoria Sektoleko. Uh, in, before we went for the break, uh, she had painted uh, a bleak picture 
about what it is we are doing, especially in her pet subject uh, of agriculture, where we are failing right from the time of producing the food to, to, to putting it on, onto the market. Yeah. But, but again, <clears throat> because you are a person who is in a position of responsibility, despite the fact that you're no longer a serving politician, you are a vice chair of the private sector foundation. Yeah. Somebody out there could be wondering, but all these things you're talking about, you have a chance to move some things through the private sector foundation. Are you saying the, the private sector foundation is helpless? It cannot do anything to avert this crisis? No, not really. Uh, one, the private sector foundation uh, is now working hand in hand with UNBS. Recently, when we got some money from MasterCard, we act, part of the money actually went to, to UNBS to make sure that uh, we make the, um, the setting of standards and uh, uh, abiding with the standards affordable. Because when, you, when we ask our members, especially the small ones, who we hope will grow into, to become big, they will tell you that they cannot go to UNBS because it is very expensive. So we asked UNBS, what, what do you need the money for? They told us, and uh, I'm happy to inform you that uh, recently they actually announced that they have actually cut most of the, 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 the fees. Because fees for what? For, 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 for registering with UNBS. Because in order to register, UNBS will have to come and inspect you and see where you are producing, what you are producing, how you are producing it, for who. If, for example, you are producing uh, like uh, biscuits and, uh, from your factory, they will, they will be coming to my mouth. The standards are really different from if you are producing ground nuts which are in the shell, you are just putting them in a sack and are sending them to me. So they, they need money to hire those inspectors, get the chemicals, do the logistics and all that, and make sure that whatever corner of Uganda that uh, product is being produced, they can get it's there. Certified. Yeah, they can get there and <coughs> certify the, the premises and the product. One of the issues with UNBS is that uh, they have a quality mark. Yeah. And uh, this quality mark is embedded on the packaging. Yes. Of uh, the container. Yeah. So the same quality mark will not guarantee the quality of the contents. If the first contents which were certified are taken out mm -hmm. and maybe somebody um, puts uh, contaminated or fake contact in there, that this quality mark is not effective. And now you're saying that uh, PSFU is supporting them to maintain this quality mark, not the way it is? Not, not really. To, uh, that, that is a detail we as PSFU did not go into. Mm. But what we co-funded with them is uh, making the certification process more affordable to the smaller uh, entrepreneurs. As for the details of exactly how they are going to do it and where they are going to put the money, honestly, we did not. I I do not have those details. That is one. Two. When uh, I was minister for agriculture, 1986 to uh, until about 1989, there was no UNBS in Uganda. It is actually this government which set up UNBS because they wanted them to do exactly that. For me, looking at UNBS, part of which I co-founded, UNBS is a growing organization. Therefore, people like you should keep giving them feedback so that they keep improving. That is one. Two. Even uh, uh, national bureaus of standards of other countries which have been there for 100 years are still improving, basically because every single day there's a new product. And that new product will not normally have uh, the standard. They have to set the standard. They have to ensure that everybody abides to that standard. So uh, UNBS is a growing organization. It's still work in progress. But exactly. during the, during the <coughs> crisis uh, we had with Kenya when they rejected our maids, yes. um, UNBS uh, passed a notice uh, requiring all maize millers uh, to get registered and approved. But uh, we were able to check uh, shortly after that, and the deadline was given. But uh, many of the maize millers up to today are not uh, registered. More than half, they are just operating. So I, I, I think that there's a problem with enforcement, 
execution. Don't you agree? UNBS has a, a problem of enforcement. In my view, I don't think the problem, the main problem is with the enforcement. In my view, the, the real problem is with consumers. The other day, I was visiting one of the large schools in Uganda, and I asked the head teacher what, what type, if I could see their portion, which they, they give the children. And uh, she proudly brought out the number one portion. You know, it was uh, really bright white. So I looked at it and told her, but really, this is just starch. She said, but that's number one. That is what the children, because the children are children, you should know better. So I told her this. What uh, was wrong with that portion? Many, many people viewing, they think super, the super refined, the white, that powder. Many people think it is the, the best maize. No. Tell because us. What, what happens at uh, these uh, maize, uh, maize millers, you take your maize there. Quite often they will inspect it using their eyes to see if it is white. Then they, they, the first thing they do is they, they remove the first cover. In fact, in some cases, they do it twice to make sure they have removed the bran. The bran is that yellow thing which you normally see when you are eating maize. So they remove the bran. That is where the protein, the oil, the whatever. The is, nutrients are uh -huh, removed. Are removed. Uh -huh. Then the, the coat, the outer coat, which is good roughage for your stomach, is also re removed. And they leave the bright white part, which is just pure starch. The inner part. Exactly. Then they make your portion. When you go to organized maize millers, when they, uh, when they are making that super, the one where they remove all that, the, the, it is more expensive. It costs right now, it is going for about 5,000 shillings. What is kilo. more expensive? The, the starch, where they have removed the bran and the coat. That white fine yes, thing. Yes, that white fine thing. Why is it expensive call. when it has no nutrients? Basically because it costs money to remove the, uh. the coat and then the bran. Then somebody will probably tell you that the maize bran and, uh, is for the chicken, the pigs, <laughs> and the cattle. So <laughs> as humans, as clever as we are, we give the nutritious part of the maize to the pigs <laughs> and the cows. So who is more clever now? That's yeah. the question. You know, you asked me if we, are, <clears throat> if we are living dead. We are not only the living dead, but we are really the living ignorant. The living ignorant, just waiting for bury your dead. Exactly. But dead already. Because you are, you are what you eat. Now, if you are going to eat that starch, and then you keep telling me, <coughs> I don't eat a lot. I don't know. <coughs> I don't know why I'm putting on weight. I mean, you are taking starch. In, even if you take like uh, f f f 50 grams, that is just pure starch. Which is converted into fat. Immediately. So, are you saying, Honorable Sector <coughs> that it is wrong, it is criminal, for schools to be serving our school children with this pure white maize? I am saying it is criminal, but I'm saying let us get rid of this ignorance. How? I've, I've told you, Nero has come up with a solution to aflatoxin. Apparently, it, it has to be applied when the maize is still in the garden. You kill the apl apl aflatoxin from there, then you dry this maize properly. Then when you get the maize meal, you, meal, you clean the maize and meal everything. When, uh, after, after this interview, I suggest you go buy yourself a number, we, we call it number three, number three uh, maize flour. You'll find that it tastes a bit like what comes from Kenya, because the, some of the Kenya maize, maize, mm. maize flour tastes different. Basically because they it's don't... It's more rough. Exactly. And that is what is best for you and for your children. Do you know that the, the children, this is interesting, the children who go to poorer schools, Eat can, better. Which cannot afford the, the super, Grade one. the number one, they eat number three. When they come back, honestly, go visit those poor people who students and boarding schools. They will have the most beautiful skin because they had their brand in their food. So we the elites <laughs> in the cities who go to the big malls, exactly. you are saying that we are ignorant. Yes. And so this so-called number one, uh, maybe it should be changed to number zero because it has zero value. Zero yeah. nutrition. Yeah, but it, before it is changed, yeah. the public should be told what they are eating. Because at the end of the day, you know when I hear people saying uh, we, we need more money for health, the question I ask is what do you mean health? Are you talking about putting more money in the hospitals or putting it in your health? In what you are eating. In what you are eating. Because we were told a long time ago by the Ministry of Health then that uh, if we can have good nutrition, 
and water, 75% of the diseases will not find us anywhere. In fact, if you wish to know, currently there are very few people suffering from the common cold, basically because of the hand washing and basically because of the water. So if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we are to reduce on the budget of Ministry of Health, the thing to do is prevail upon every Ugandan to put to invest in themselves first by eating right. But invest with the appropriate knowledge. Exactly. And you are giving knowledge now. Exactly. So, so for us as the League of the Genuine, <coughs> picking a cue from what you're saying, we are going to demand an audit. Yeah. An audit of the food before schools are open. They say they open next year. Yeah. One of the conditions for opening schools is we must have an audit who are your suppliers? They are, what food are they supplying? Because if you're saying that uh, we are busy affecting our health, affecting our life, yeah. affecting the life of our children mm -hmm. by what we are giving them, mm -hmm. then what is the point of looking on? Because I will tell you that in law, uh, you can be considered to aid and abet the commission of an offense if you look by. Uh, and uh, you know and you do nothing. So in order for us not to be charged mm -hmm. with aiding and abetting, mm -hmm. we need to do something. So we shall, after this, get information from you. Let's write to the Ministry of, of, of Education. I hope they take the information. But the Maybe they are thing, part of the problem. Let me tell you the shortcut. Yeah. Inform these children to demand inform the, the children, children and to, the parents yes to demand because i remember when i was at school we used to eat our teachers used to eat what we eat and they would actually tell us today we are eating this because you are young girls or you you need to grow you need to to to, to mature so it was not like uh, they would everybody it was deliberate. So even now, the feeding of the children should be deliberate. But honorable, our culture, you know how children are brought up here. Uh -huh. We have a culture of respect. It is in discipline. If some, a child speaks up and so on, uh, and you causing a, a revolt uh, in the home. The culture here is, I, I think we also have a saying that you cannot look, I don't know how it translates, you cannot look at an elder in the in the eye in the eye or you have to talk while looking down so so how are you expecting where we have this predominant culture how are we expecting uh, the children to demand when they leave school they can demand okay but at home the, the, the father the mother will probably buy uh, grade one maize the white one yeah but uh, if you have a child at home who has been sensitized you come with your number one and this child says oh my god you are going to kill the whole family they were like, what is happening? You'll pay attention. Yeah, you definitely pay attention. And they will tell you, today I'm not eating posho because I want number three and you have brought number one. They're like, what? You go back to the shop and number three is 2,000 shillings. Number one is, 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 is 5,000. So you are like, this kid must be joking. You bring the number three and it gets finished in a day or two. You go back and you are like, eh, mfiraj. But that is an irony. It's a paradox because usually more expensive things are of better quality. In Uganda. In Uganda, things are different. Things are different. Yeah. So for me, my wish is that every Ugandan knows what we are talking about. Before we leave the posho and we leave the dining room, let us talk about the vegetables. Currently, we have uh, COVID and everybody is being told to consume a lot of vegetables and fruits. And uh, these days, the, 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 the breeders have come up with the most beautiful nakati, beautiful dodo. You go to the market and it's looking so beautiful. Tomatoes. Uh -huh. But then, when you push backwards, you ask to visit this person who is delivering the nakati. And he tells you, I live here at about 5 a.m. You are like, okay, I'll be with you at 5 a.m. You think you are going to the garden to pick the nakati? And he says, no, 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 I picked it last night and it is in the river. So in you, the river? Yes. They, they pick this nakati, put it in sacks and, and put it in the river in the evening. So in the morning, I think about 4 a.m., they load all this nakati straight from the water, looking so beautiful, really glim, gl glistening. And they go to the market. You get there, especially if you get there at about 7, 6, or 7 8 o'clock, oh, it is looking beautiful. Now, so they bathe the Nakati? Yes, they bathe the Nakati. But when you What's look... What's wrong with that? When you look at the river where they are putting uh, the Nakati, hmm. the water is practically black. 
But for them, for, for the Makati, it is, it is water. So they, they get it out, shake it a bit, and it is looking beautiful. But even before that, these days nearly everything they plant, the first thing they buy after the seeds is the spray. You don't know when this Nakati was last sprayed. Now they sprayed it maybe yesterday or the day before, then they have dipped it in that, uh, in that pond, then you take it home. Have you noticed that most maids, assister, our kitchen assistants, don't eat greens? So they don't care. She'll pick these greens and put it under the seat. They that, don't that. eat because it's a delicacy, reserved for the boss. No. Yeah. Most of them will tell you, Biantama, that is why I left the village. So when they serve, let's say if you are serving in the kitchen and she is putting the food on everybody's plate, she will not put it on her plate. Not because they are not enough. Even if their vegetables are left in the plate, she will not eat them. They just so so are you so advocating? Ignorance. Are you advocating against? Because we haven't told healthy living. These people are into these days. People are into healthy living. Yes. The exercising vegetables. Mm -hmm. Now you're pushing us away from vegetables. No, I'm saying you are not too weak, too tired, too old to grow your own vegetables. Most of you, especially you middle income people in Kampala, you have got those wonderful compounds. It takes like five by five feet of space for you to produce enough dodo to feed your family every single day for the whole month. And most of you have got a quarter of an acre, a, half, a whole acre which you are living on. And you are suffering with trees. We cutting, are throwing parties cutting, there. Yes, cutting the grass every now and then, making noise for your neighbors. Why can't you turn that into your healthy garden? garden. And yeah, especially you lawyers, eventually God help you, I can see you becoming a judge. When you become a judge, you are going to need to do a bit of exercise. Now if you are planting these vegetables and you dutifully go and inspect, that in itself is good for you because you are breathing in the oxygen directly from the vegetables into your, 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 your head. Especially because now, they take in carbon dioxide and, and express oxygen. Exactly. And uh, apparently it gives you a lot of happiness when you go into the garden and harvest something. That is the way we are made. So, why am I talking about lawyers? You sit for a long time, but you need a reason to get out of your house. Now, if the reason But we is, talk too much, so maybe we balance out. But not even the talking, hmm. after the talking, you need to eat certain vitamins in order to invigorate your system straight from the head to the mouth to the throat and everything. So... It is good if you can have your garden where you walk, you bend, because uh, that's Exercise. why you are not, yeah, you are exercising, but you are not like sweating. Like now we have COVID, nobody is close to you, so nobody is going to affect you as, as opposed to going to the gym. So my suggestion to everybody, look at what you are eating, know why you are eating it. And if you don't know where it is coming from, you are not sure, because like people buy, I'm sorry for people who are doing this business, but I'm going to say it. People buy apples from along the road. Now, when you buy those apples, you find that they, 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 there is gloss painted on the apples. Because those apples travel thousands of uh, miles before they get to, to Chira Road, where you pass, they, we have to paint them so that we keep that. There is paint on the apples. Exactly. You, you buy it today, it is glossy. You buy it on Friday, it is close. But they are packed, they are packed in, uh, in boxes. Yeah. No, but they get them from the boxes. Yes, and then they put them they in are the from Kabeira. Egypt, uh -huh. South Africa. Now, out there, both those two countries paint their, their apples in readiness for sale. So when you go to buy, you find it shiny as opposed to a natural. If you, if you get a, a, a poor, I call it poor. Uh, apple from Kabale uh, Kunjiru, where they are growing them now, and you compare it with this one from Kamocha. Uh, uh, this one has uh, some preservatives. Near the police, you see that this one is very, very shiny. What will surprise you is when you bite into it, because we advise you to eat the skin. The skin does not taste the same as the one from Rukunjiri. It's basically because they have painted it with that gloss in order to keep it shiny. And that preservative is dangerous. Very dangerous. It is not supposed to be you, eaten. You saw recently. And you rich people buy all those apples and proudly arrive home taking to your children. And put in the fridge. Taking poison. I, recently I saw a report uh, from South Africa. Mm -hmm. There is a packaged apple juice called Ceres yes. Apple and Orange. Yes. They withdrew it from the market because they, they were saying that they found a lot of pesticide residue. Exactly. 
But it, can I ask, why would you, Fred, be buying series from, from the supermarket? Really, coming from Busoga there, the mother of all oranges, tangerine and lemons. We have got honey. F squeeze your juice, fresh juice, put your honey. And take. No, because of modernization. What is Aspiration. modernization? You can, we can co co count modernize your fridge as part of modernization. Get somebody, maybe on a Saturday, to make this juice in maybe five different bottles, put them in the fridge, get out one, and one at a time if you are in a hurry. Do it like that. But have something you know rather than... What going you, for whatever you find. Yeah. And, so, and when you people get visitors, you bring these things out proudly. Fortunately, it is beautiful to be old. For me, I would tell you, I'm only going to drink water, and in any case, I brought my water. <laughs> I see even you came with your own uh, water here. Yeah. But you are saying we should plant. The elites, those with gardens, should plant. But and eat planting you know. mm. these vegetables, there are a lot of seeds, vegetable seeds, that are sold on the market. Of course, many are fake. But my question now, I'll be moving you to genetically modified, maybe there are seeds as well. Mm -hmm. Some people think that genetically modified foods or seeds are fake. Should we be planting these? Uh, uh, are they hybrid? Are they those genetically modified? Shouldn't we look for the original orange seed from Busoga, not this one sold in the... The problem with uh, genetically modified uh, systems is that most people who talk about them don't have a clue what they are talking about. That is one. Two. Many of uh, Ugandan uh, middle, middle income people have been abroad. When you go to countries like New Zealand, Australia, Germany, whatever, they, m quite a number of their staff has been modified. And they will not come to your dining table and tell you that uh, while you are going to eat this, there is this type of wheat and there is this type of apple. No, that is one. And that is the least important. The most important thing is this. Every single day, you will hear adverts being made over the radios. You are going to plant uh, cabbage. This is the, the drumhead cabbage. It is the best. It will be big. It is uh, this yeah. and the other. And nobody ever asks, is it uh, GMO? Because in Uganda, we do not have a law which allows us to ask. All we are doing, like the, with the tomatoes, we used to have... No, that. we have the Access to Public Information Act. You can ask for this information. Yeah. But anyway, go on. Mm. Yeah. While well, you can ask, there is no law prohibiting me from importing GMOs here. So you can ask and I'll tell you it is a GMO. Then what? So what should be done is, first of all, we should pass that GMO law. law for a completely different reason, not because I want anything imported or whatever. Because now that we are promoting scientists, I would like us to have our own scientists who I can take aside and say, you are my son. I took you to school. Is this safe? And knowing that... Ask you, them, exactly, because they are experts. Ask my expert. Instead of asking the poison guy, the guy in charge of poison, to tell me if the poison will kill me quickly or slowly. The vendor, the one who wants to make a profit. So the reason mm. I want this bill is for, so that our young people can have the courage, can see the light in order to go and study GMOs, in order to protect us, Uganda, against GMOs. For now, it is like when somebody says, oh, don't train the army because they may kill people. We need... <laughs> we <laughs> but need, they can protect as exactly. well. Exactly. We need to train these people so that they can understand. Or, but to take it, they, they should be the ones to understand, explain to us, and we trust them. So people want to know, are genetically modified seeds or foods counterfeit or not? No. First of all, that two... That, that, let me say this. There are genuine uh, GMOs. But the counterfeit industry is not sparing any part. It is faking. GMOs may have their own scientific exactly. issues. Exactly. But then the faker comes and also fakes exactly. the, the GMOs. Exactly. Oh, Which so, is a different so, so GMOs story. on their own are not dangerous. No, 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 no. I'm not saying they are not dangerous. In fact, what we say about GMOs is that uh, if, let's say, I'm going to feed your GMOs, I need your consent. You need to know that this is GMO. That is why some of those products which, were, which are in our um, supermarkets, 
which are GMOs, are clearly labeled that they are GMOs. Are the vegetables GMOs? The seeds, were they GMOs? The cabbage, the onions? Oh, wait, wait a moment. Most of the seeds, for example, most uh, onion seeds mm. in Uganda are imported. So they are GMO? I don't know who is checking to see if they are GMO or if they are not GMO. I don't know. Same with uh, the, the, the tomatoes, because as you know, by now, there are so many different types of tomatoes in Uganda. Mm. If some of them are GMO, I don't know. Basically because that bill was not passed into an act of parliament, and Maif does not have the door to close to GMOs. So we are basically, they are free for all. Yes. We, we don't know we whether... We did not only open the door, we took it off the hinges. So everybody you go to open the door, you take out the hinges. You go with the door. We need prayers. Unfortunately. We must end this, but uh, I cannot end without uh, talking about another area which is very challenging, mm -hmm. the marriage institution. Mm -hmm. President Silulu of Tanzania, I don't know whether it's true she said it, but uh, is reported to have told Tanzanian men to report to the police any lady, girl, who asks them for money when they are not their wife. Yeah. Um, as, as, as fun as it is, or uh, queer as it is, it raises an important question about money in the marriage institution. To what extent is money contributing to the collapse of the marriage institution, or even contributing to fake marriages? I saw the comment attributed to High Excellency, the President of the Republic of Tanzania, and being me, the first question I asked is, uh, what if the one asking for the money is a man? <laughs> because here she is saying, you married men, if this is not your wife. She should have said, and you women, if this man is not your husband. Why? Because there are a lot of uh, young men nowadays mm -hmm. who are looking for women with looking money. Looking for women with money. Therefore, and if it is a law, it should cut both ways. That is one. Now, Maybe it's work in progress. She will make another announcement for the men. Was she too but tired? for now, it's for women. Was uh -huh. she too tired to, to, to add the men? <laughs> anyway, about fake marriages. In a few cases, one may say there are fake marriages. But in my view, I, don't, I wouldn't attribute all the fakes in people's behavior towards money. Some people just want the, you know, the owners that come with being married. Others genuinely are tired being uh, alone. This woman may be getting married because she wants company. Unfortunately, this man also happens to have money, but in order to make money, he's away most of the time. So as far as the woman is concerned, this is a fake marriage. What she wanted was company. Not a lot of money. Compassion. Uh -huh, compassion. But this man is not there. So for me, looking at the marriage institution, which everybody agrees is the most complicated institution, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the marriages are collapsing because of money. Because what I find whenever I'm driving through the villages, especially if you are driving around lunchtime and these uh, rural P Ugandans are eating their lunch outside, you see a lot of happiness in the faces of these people. And there's not a lot of money there. So I don't know whether these people are staying because there is no money. But even when you go out in Kampala and you go to this restaurant and uh, people are being served, you see a lot of happiness. Is it because... But that's artificial, is, some people would say. Yeah. When they go back to their house, mm -hmm. actually during COVID, a lot of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Because people left the streets where they were happy and enjoying a meal with their friends. Mm -hmm. As soon as they entered the house, mm -hmm. some even killed each other. So that could be a facad. Yeah, but uh, those facads are everywhere. Not only in marriage, in marriage institution, even in partnership, business partnerships. You can have fake partners. Let's say I know you, you are the son of the former chief of Uguiri and you are going to inherit this and I become your partner targeting that. So really, it is not only, it is not only the, 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 the marriage institution. Yeah. But, but your word on this, is it the woman causing problems in the marriage or it's the man? I know you can be objective on uh, this. No, I will, and I will, say, I, will say, I will tell you the truth. Mm. It is the system. 
It is the, it is system. the system. Because you give birth to a boy and uh, he grows up, he turns 30 and you are waiting to see a girl. But amongst all the things you have discussed, you have never discussed the girl. Now and then you angrily say, uh, when are you getting out of the house anyway? When are you getting a partner? And the poor boy has no idea whatsoever. Some time back I was uh, talking to some men, really respectable men, I will not say their names. And I told them that while you are complaining that we, the women, are spending a lot of time getting our girls ready to get married, we are not preparing the men. But that's they are, true. They are get, going to get mm. married too. But Fred, I have never been a man. I don't know how to prepare them. I don't know how you proposed. To your, to your wife. I know, I, I know what but to tell But you have never managed a man. You've been in the institution, so you know what the man needs, no, and what, therefore you can guide what, it. But if I was a boy, I would respect more and better what my father tells me, rather than my mother telling me from the angle of the girl, and then I, I start guessing. Children are very close to their mothers. So, you know that. So men, they don't listen to their dad. Men, you are not going to get away. <laughs> don't be fake dad. Don't be counterfeit dad. <laughs> Do your job. Bring up this boy. And, maybe, and tell them. Yeah, maybe we should go back to that system where, you know, among the, the Bama Sava, when a boy turns, I think, 15, they have that uh, day when they do the circumcision. Mm. Of course, the reason it takes so long is that that boy is supposed to visit nearly every relative along the way. Because this, for a reason I don't understand, the circumcision is not like you wake up today and they do it tomorrow. No. They spend time, they visit, they talk, they listen, they, and these uncles turn up with this knife and they tell them, you are now a man, you do this and the other. But in Uganda, so, who, who, when does that function take place? So if you as a father end up being a fake father, you are giving us a fake son, we, the, the women, the grandmothers keep looking, this boy, Nothing so happening you end up with fake marriages exactly, and real divorces fake, and breakups. You had a fake husband. Because the breakups are real. The, not the fake. Breaks, yeah, because of the fakeness in the whole system. That is why I'm saying don't blame the boy, don't blame the woman, blame the system. You need to blame technology. Here, this period, we've been talking about technology and counterfeits. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your, and we know technology has helped to improve, uh, human life, but it has also caused some misery. So as we sign off, can you tell us your best technology and your worst technology ever made? In my view, what I would call worst is in the kitchen. Basically because you are what you eat. A lot of technology has gone in the kitchen because we no longer want to do manual things, but the way most of this equipment is used is leaving us eating like uh, rubbish just going through because you find like i told you earlier somebody is uh, preparing groundnut paste because when we were young we used to use our mortar and pestle yes and the, the groundnuts would be broken but would not be made into fine flour you know that over processing in itself is a problem is a problem so for me, that technology in the, the then before the I grinder, know, that machine that grinds mm -hmm. the but even the, the pans, even the pans we use. Do you know that uh, f some time back the the, the 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 craze was buying those blackened saucepans in the kitchen? Mm. But if you buy those saucepans and use them for about a year or two, they start losing that black. Where does it go? Into in the food, food, into your system. Exactly. So for me, that is really terrible. Well, the, be the best that has happened to me is communication. Because now that, for example, we have this uh, COVID and the world has become one village. My, I've got family in Australia, United States, Scotland, Canada, and so on and so forth. How would I be managing waiting for a letter for a month that is to come through the post. To come through the post. But here you talk video instant. Exactly. I wake up, I'm thinking about you, and I'm like, call me as soon as you wake up. And they call, and we talk, and I'm at peace. So for me, that, that is one. Two, even for governments, it is much easier now, if you can use technology properly, it is much easier now to, to manage this country. Because, for example, we say there was a time when uh, it was illegal to move cattle at night. But who is going to spend sleepless nights manning the, the roads? But now with technology, 
We know the roads which uh, transport the our cattle. cattle. Corridor. You mm -hmm. can just put those. Uh, we have now got to put GPS. those cameras. Yeah, mm -hmm. We have got those cameras. Just keep watching. Those who are cattle moving. This is the Antonde. They are not supposed to be moving at this time. Where are they going? So technology is, is, is uh, there is a lot of technology which has come up. But for me, communication is stops. key. So you want to ask the government to open up Facebook? First of all, they talk of fake no, wait, news. Wait. Fortunately, yeah. Facebook is no longer there. It I is just now want, meta. Yeah, I just want the government to be part of technology. Let to us open it up. up. Open up uh, communication because we all need it. But most importantly, the young people who are trying to fit in this era, which is a digital era. This should be allowed. Yeah, should be allowed. What about those abusing? Because that's the argument. They abuse, they insult. First of all... That's fakeness also. First, You're first encouraging of all, it. once hmm. never killed anybody. That is one. Two, I remember some time back, it could be like 20 years ago, the current president of the Republic of Uganda told us that he himself subjected himself to us so we can abuse, we can do whatever. He even went as far as saying that while well, he has got two hands, this word, the right hand he has given to Uganda, it is for shaking hands, but the left hand is for him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so le, le, let me specifically say this, Mr. President, sir. Even if you close this channel, you just end up popularizing another. Now you close Facebook, it has become meta. Are you going to revise this memo which closed <laughs> Facebook in order to close meta? And meta is no longer Facebook. So my suggestion would be for us to have another look at uh, what we have, see how best we can localize it, domesticate it, how we can regulate it. And even these young people who are busy using uh, bad language, you normally reap what you sow. We gave birth to them, we nurtured them. They we see us reaping. using bad language, they anyway, also apply it. Everywhere. Exactly. That we must end there. This, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Honorable, for the uh, conversation, for the nuggets of wisdom that uh, you have shared with us. Um, we have taken the advice as lawyers. I'm going to do a garden from here for my vegetables. But walk, uh, walk. But walk a lot, do exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been our guest of the month. We have, I have been interviewing uh, Honorable Victoria Sektoreko, uh, former Minister of Agriculture, former director, Food and Agriculture Organization, vice chairman, private sector foundation, uh, chairperson, Uganda Agribusiness Alliance, and many, many other titles. <coughs> the most important being grandmother and advisor. Officially, you are the advisor for the League of the Genuine. We appreciate so much uh, your having made the time. And we also appreciate your company and those who have followed us and still follow us. Uh, please do so because this is the only show on the planet that talks about the important but ignored subject of counterfeits and fake products. Remember to like and share. Uh, remember to put the notification button. Remember to be with us every Friday uh, because we always will bring you uh, more and more episodes on this subject. So until then, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning from whatever you're watching in the world.